multiple degrees and a PhD. She offers computational design solutions for human life in extreme environments on Earth, Moon, and Mars. She is visiting professor at Politecnico di Milano, where she teaches the course Architecture for Human Space Exploration. She has also created a collaborative classroom with the MIT Media Lab named Design Exploration Towards Moon Architecture. She has developed various award-winning projects, mostly organized by international space agencies. Her projects have been presented in several international venues. Her research focuses on developing new computation design methods for multi-performance habitats, soft robotic prosthetics to facilitate mobility and dexterity in microgravity. Her research also focuses on textile architecture and advanced construction, construction techniques using in situ resource utilization for a sustainable human space exploration. Her passion for enhancing human performance during deep space exploration missions has led her to her current journey, and she is here to discuss sustainable design strategy and major aspects of planning and designing to enable human, uh, human lunar exploration. We welcome you, Dr. Sumini. Thank you for joining us today. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'm very honored to be with you today, the International Moon Day, and I'm very excited also to uh, take a little bit about my projects and also look forward to see your project that we're going to develop in uh, the next days. Uh, please let me share uh, my screen. Okay, so the talk, uh, the today talk is about sustainable design strategy and major aspect of planning and designing to enable human, uh, human lunar exploration. Uh, has been said uh, for this kind of introduction. Actually, yes, I'm, I'm a space architect, a visiting professor at Politecnico di Milano, and also a space architect research affiliate at MIT Media Lab within the Space Exploration Initiative, where I actually do perform research uh, to enable human space exploration, uh, envisioning different uh, uh, settlements and habitable solutions, both for the Moon and Mars, and now we're also uh, expanding on low Earth orbit and cis lunar orbit. Uh, so, so far, I, I designed uh, both like at the, the planning level for a settlement for the Moon. I also uh, start thinking of how we can really uh, design spacesuits and, and prosthetics to actually enhance uh, uh, human performance in, uh, in microgravity or reduce gravity condition. I, I also work on, on interiors like the Marsh Living Observatory portal, like how we can really design spaces that could mitigate the negative effect of isolation and confinement in extreme environments and some other artistic installation like orbiting to democratize the access to space, uh, to people, to get people engaged and, and learn more about what does it mean, uh, the concept of floating in microgravity. And also, uh, I was also lately focused on how we can really uh, make food production system autonomous, because if you want to uh, look uh, forward to uh, sustainable human space exploration, we also need to find a way to produce food locally using maximizing the using of in-situ resources. And finally, uh, computational design tools for um, optimizing uh, the structure, optimizing the use of uh, ISRU, and actually find autonomous way to uh, robotically fabricate it there in, in situ. Uh, some of these projects that we actually uh, developed in the you know, Space Exploration Initiative have been published, especially the ones who have been tested in, uh, in analog uh, environment, like on a parabolic flight, where we tested the microgravity and reduced gravity conditions, and uh, also the International Space Station, Suborbital flights with Blue Origin. This is the wonderful team at Space Expression Initiative, and these are some of the projects that you will find in this application. So if you want uh, to know more about the entire uh, group, and this is intrinsically multidisciplinary, as space architecture and space design should be. And uh, please have a look at, at this uh, actual uh, publication. Uh, but as far as we would like to focus the talk today about what we are currently doing uh, for the moon, which are the vision, which are the plans, and, and why we really want to uh, go back there. So, uh, so far, uh, uh, going back to the first step by Neil Armstrong, so this is one small step for men, but one giant leap for mankind was the 20th July 20th, 1969. And today we are here uh, talking about what we're going to do next. So, next from them is uh, one of the projects that we are currently really involved. Also because I'm um, both uh, uh, actually currently designing both from Italy side and also US side is really in the framework of the NASA TEMIS program since uh, there is an agreement ongoing between Italy and United States for designing uh, 
series uh, of the space architecture for, for the moon. And so, yeah, so this is the concept. We want to go back to the moon, it's time to say. And so within this framework, we have like a lot of different uh, space exploration steps in, the, in that framework and the first robotic mission and then after to go uh, to a human mission afterward. This was actually uh, the last ones uh, uh, of their team is. And the first step will be generating a, a, a orbital space station in the system our orbit named the uh, Gateway. It will enable astronauts to live there uh, for a few weeks actually, and also to drive a robotic mission to the moon and possibly also maybe to land and also drive some exploration over there. And uh, it is uh, um, international efforts in trying to design in the uh, sea lunar uh, uh, gateway. They had also some uh, module dedicated to the habitation system. This is the environment, it's the environment of microgravity. So we actually take the expertise that we learn from the International Space Station and we're going to apply it for, the, uh, for this uh, uh, actual concept. But the very end, the very the, the big goal is actually establishing uh, an Artemis base camp at the south pole of the moon by the end of this decade. Uh, and this is intriguing because this means uh, really uh, a giant leap because we have to learn how to use in situ resources. We have to understand uh, which type of resources we could have at the south pole of the moon. How do we safely land and how do we try to uh, exploit these resources and then use it to fabricate in situ with the local material, the structure that we need and integrate with the world, the structure we could actually bring directly from Earth. But this is an extremely fascinating topic since the environmental constraints that we have in that condition um, are, are really extreme. And so here in this table, you can find some some interesting value you can look at. So we, you can see the difference between Earth, lower orbit, the Moon, and Mars. And besides the concept that the, the gravity is, uh, of course, is we have microgravity in lower orbit, reduce the gravity equal to one sixth of G on the Moon and one third for Mars. Then there's the concept is that we don't have any sort of atmosphere, and also we don't have on the Moon any sort of protection uh, against galactic cosmic rays. And, and so this actually generates another need. So we just need to pressurize our habitat fully. I also the International Space Station has this need since we don't have any atmosphere on Earth. And, when, and so we have to really pressurize. So we have to des design these pressure vessels that actually contain uh, actually our um, humans inside, but we also have to uh, mitigate for all the condition related to, of course, thermal variations that are actually extreme and also to protect against galactic cosmic rays. And those are actually very uh, complex uh, structural um, designs since it requires a lot of material to generate this sort of protection. And also uh, something that is interesting, the fact that when we design for um, humans, we have to think into account uh, different aspects because we are just, we are not just bringing like a settlement over there, but we actually want to create a kind of an ecosystem over there. And so we have to consider many different aspects, like we are doing here on Earth. So we have to bring with us when designing a space architecture ecosystem. We have to bring with us all the knowledge related to space science, to learning, understanding the planetary body we are designing for. Uh, all different types of engineering from nuclear engineering that we need also for energy sources, but also all the radiation protection analysis that we could have that against the galactic cosmic radiation and also the mechanical engineering and material engineering and structural engineering. Uh, all the knowledge related to industrial design, since we really want to uh, also be focused on how this experience, how this design could really help uh, humans to live better inside these uh, small volumes and tiny spaces. I know I'm sure you probably uh, see uh, the interiors of the International Space Station right now, so the, the spaces are very tight. And so, how we can really optimize the design and to do enhanced ergonomics and, and then working about also interfaces to actually help operation like enhanced operation in this sort of condition. There's some medicines because all this uh, telehealth will be very important uh, to in that framework and also how all these uh, sensor networks can also be used to monitor um, the, uh, the astronauts health during the mission. Uh, and, uh, and so it would be important to how incorporate this within the habitat concept and also psychology. So how all uh, psychology enters within the space and how spaces and the architecture, also the interior design can actually help and improve, uh, actually mitigate some negative effect of, of the exploration, especially thinking of long-term mission in the, this isolated and confined environment. And also art, because we'll be able to generate some artistic expression of this exploration because we are humans, so we need also that. 
that. So a lot of these actually compose the space architecture. So as you can see, it's very uh, multidisciplinary efforts. And the, so far, the several concepts have been designed and, and uh, actually tested in other facilities and so on. And this, what you can see right now, is a synthesis of what I did with some of my students, thinking that those are all concepts that have been designed. And, take into account from a lunar and also Martian uh, space architecture ecosystem. You can see how these different functions have been distributed in different concepts from Marsha, from Arbitation House, even NASA Marseille's House and Architecture of the Moon. So all of these have different design concepts, but all they have the need to create a sort of pressurized a uh, vessel to contain, of course, uh, human activities inside and actually create a shielding and also uh, using in situ resources, maximizing, for example, the use of the lunar regolith is a very, um, and it's a basaltic material, so it's very like, more like a concrete, if you want to think of, is uh, possible to 3D print it. And so using robotic construction uh, systems to really fabricate the uh, shielding. And we can also think of uh, how we can uh, really combine something that we, the structure we can bring from Earth, so especially the pressure vessel is actually composed of the, all the interiors and uh, life support system is actually integrated and then actually then shielded uh, with the local material. And those are uh, other concepts from Mars X house, Lunar, Moon Village, Red Light, and the uh, Village from uh, ESA and Cinder Hub and Igluna. So all of these also have different concepts. Some of them you think of, for example, some analog structure was a thing of, for example, 3D, uh, 3D printing over a space origami uh, type of structure. So it can be easy foldable uh, and uh, it can be folded, put it inside the uh, furnace, the payload uh, of the launch vehicle, and then deploy once uh, uh, reached the destination and, and so on. So those are uh, the modularity that you need if you want to compose multiple modules together, if you want to aggregate them. And also the modularity you can think of, for example, for the center regulate cost Construction element can be sort of bricks and they actually be uh, stuck on top of the structure, creating this sort of uh, protective sh um, shielding. And some of uh, some uh, rendering of some of these concepts is, for example, is a moon village designed by a foster partners in, uh, with ESA. So when you find this inflatable structure that is actually entirely covered by a thick uh, wall of about two meters of, of regulate, and the way this can be 3D printed and the pattern that was really interesting and allows you to kind of have this sort of structure that cover up this entire um, inflatable element with also some windows that can be also shattered also to prevent micrometeoroid and uh, impact and that you can also enable the view from, uh, from Earth from the south pole of the moon. This is a very recent project that you see a search plus and icon together when can, for example, use the, again, the concept of 3D printing the lunar regolith, but with a different type of pattern, with a different type of solution. It's very intriguing from an aesthetics perspective. And see here is the integration of how we can really build that is in there, uh, the entire structure on the moon. Um, this is the lunar habitat uh, system uh, and uh, by Saga Space Architects. So they tested this concept. It's an origami uh, folded structure. It is fully covered by solar panels to actually collect energy from the sun and also can be easily deployed and they tested in, in the Arctic. So it's very intriguing. And you can actually, this concept could actually be uh, expanded from concept of thinking of lunar uh, type of, of environment, for instance. And then this is very intriguing. They also very useful think how we can pack a structure just to decrease its volume and while of course maintain the mass at minimum always and then deploy it and inflate and then pressurizes once it reaches uh, of course uh, uh, the surface of, of the moon and then over the years also some other concepts agile concepts have been implemented those are kind of type of some mobile habitats like Hubble from by Mark Cohen uh, with such of legs that can work around and move on the lunar surface also a scorpion who's actually a mobile sort of vehicle where actually needs also mobility is a habitable rover if you want to think of but you can also live inside and it's also very interesting the the, uh, the biomimicry uh, of the scorpion structure also for the radiator and, and the solar panels and also the flight system so as i mentioned before our main constraint right now is the solar is the, sorry the flight system so the launching bay that we have available today are kind of limited even if we know that spacex and nasa and other international space agencies are working on improving these launching capabilities in terms of uh, volume and mass and so right now, though, we are 
still constrained uh, with a dynamic volume uh, that actually has a diameter of uh, four and a half meters, for example, to be actually uh, fully in line with the, the constraint that we have. Also because we want to design with something that actually has a, a short horizon, a short framework, because as I mentioned before, not that MS program foresee uh, the first expiration just a few years from now. And by the end of this decade, uh, of course, it is uh, this sort of base camp. And so we want to use uh, launching vehicles that are actually available right now. And the one project that was directly involved in is uh, the Moon Village project. It's a uh, concept done in partnership between Skidmo, Owens, and Mario. I'm sure you probably know it's one of the most uh, famous uh, architecture offices, uh, special, uh, uh, specialized in uh, skyscraper design, did Burj Khalifa, the highest skyscraper in the world. And, and together with the expertise, by, um, the architecture engineering expertise by SOM, together with expert at different ESA, uh, European Space Agency, um, engineers and scientists, and also with two aspects. Astronauts, an astronaut from by Isaac Linaret and then NASA astronaut Jeffrey Hoffman, who is also professor at MIT, another MIT team uh, with MIT Media Lab, with myself and Professor, uh, professor Joseph Paradiso. We all together designed this concept of a moon village, the South Pole, the moon along the Shaketon uh, uh, crater. Um, the South Pole is intriguing because, as a scientist and information have actually detected the ice deposit uh, within also in the, um, the, the area that are always exposed to, to shadow, like the crater, for example. Uh, and it's interesting because this uh, we really need eyes. We need eyes eye for the eye support system, but also we need eyes also to um, understand uh, many things about how we can make it a sustainable food production system, for example, uh, to grow food and, and plants over there. And, and maybe how we can actually embed with the technology of uh, 3D printing using city resources like the further the rainbow did. And to do this uh, uh, research, uh, uh, of course, uh, the entire crater rim has been analyzed in terms of slope, understanding which would have been the best place to locate uh, the habitat within it. And here, a uh, video. And so, as you have uh, the possibility to see in the video, uh, we had to take into account different aspects. So, from the launching and landing pad area, this is actually usually, so in this render, you can see a compress because we wanted to put it all together, but actually, you need to stay at two kilometers at least from the uh, habitation area of the, um, of course, of the settlement. And then you have to start thinking how. To design this launching and landing pad in order to prevent, for example, uh, the dust, so the regular dust that actually can actually uh, cover up, and, and so you don't want that. So you just want to protect and also make it like a safer uh, area. And then you want to connect this with the South Atlantic through a series of infrastructure, like especially roads that can actually be centered. And, and once you get there, you have to define different aspects, for example, how you organize your habitation module, the full production system, solar towers and power, and the power storage, in situ resource utilization, and also how you can shield all the robots, because also robots can be damaged uh, by the entire lunar environment. And, uh, and then, of course, how you can uh, actually connect all of these that we got inspired by the linear linear city since you were actually designing along the Shekhaton Greater Rim. This is why you can find this linearity in 
within this concept. Um, as I mentioned before, there are different types of structures. So right now, the International Space Station, uh, for example, in lower orbit, has been designed with pre-integrated units, pre-integrated modules. It is, uh, has a technical name, class one habitat, since it's entirely built uh, on Earth, and then it's actually a ship in lower orbit and then uh, assembled with other modules over there. But then we also have class two habitats. They're the one that we are targeting for this type of uh, uh, first exploration there on our surface. It is actually is a, a modular system can bring uh, from Earth, but it can actually be assembled uh, on site and also integrated with local resources, like such as regulate, especially these for the use of water in our life support system, and also, for example, with the regulate for creating this uh, shielding micrometeorite uh, protection. And also you have class three habitats that are actually this that can actually be entirely uh, um, based uh, using in situ resources and can actually be constructed in situ. And so, and, and, and this is actually the main relation. Those are the class three habitats, the most advanced ones. So this is, for example, one of the cons when you have this uh, integrated uh, inflatable element that is uh, fully pressurized and deployed in C2 then and be actually covered with this uh, uh, regulated shielding. And this is intriguing since uh, we can have, we still have to understand especially how uh, the regulator can be managed and, and be used to do this type of work and which type of, how much energy do you require actually to 3D print over there. So we really need to go there actually to understand, to try and, and do some experiments in that sense. Um, then as I said, for the uh, fact that you can have pre-integrated uh, system, for example, you can have an assembly that is based the human, it can also be uh, robotically assisted, and the class two modular system also had some uh, human assisted and pneumatic, while the class three habitat is uh, assisted human and robotics, because you really need to have a robotic system helping you to uh, fabricate these type of structures. Here, for example, a view of another type of elements that actually have to contain, uh, for example, the robotics uh, system or uh, vehicles that need to be protected against like the, uh, the outer environment. But uh, for instance, they don't have to be pressurized, okay? Uh, they don't need uh, atmosphere. Okay? So then you can see how it changes the shape of the shielding. Uh, for example, in here, those are, for example, would contain uh, some sort of uh, inflatable elements and they have this type of structure, but this one, for example, can just be uh, not pressurized at all, so they, can, they just need to sustain and withstand reduced gravity of the moon. This is also why the optimization that you can see here is different because it just has a different type of load that you have to uh, withstand. And this is the type of concept for each habitat, uh, each one moon habitat in terms of different levels, habitation area and the volumes that you need and how you can actually find activities inside. And, and the SLM did here wonderful work understanding what can be uh, compacted, what can be foldable and unfolded and uh, how this system can be uh, fully uh, accessible even across levels. And these are some thick peak of interiors with the concept of recreating also some bubble of intimacy since entire, the space, entirely space architecture is really shared. So it's very minimum and small. And so part of the target is how we can really announce uh, the concept of uh, uh, being in long-term mission on the surface of the moon, being with other astronauts all the time, but still have our bubble of privacy and, the, and to actually connect with home, etc. So this is why we, we actually redefine a series of crews, small, uh, uh, small crew quarters, but can actually have their own independent area for themselves. And uh, this project has been exhibited at the Binar Architecture last year in, uh, in Venice. And these are like the picture of the mock-ups that have been built in that occasion. And, uh, and we try in there to showcase all the concept from the master plan in here, uh, from the National Landing Valley up to the, all this linear city across the Shigetum uh, Crater Rim. And then inside the integration of multiple level and all the activities in, inside and uh, and also with the concept of having some greens and the plants are very important, again, to reconnect humans with nature in, um, in this type of confined environment. And nothing just important to produce food locally, so they really design entire autonomous greenhouse system infrastructure, but also to 
we reconnect with plants and nature and uh, also for well, mental well-being. Uh, last thing I would like to, to mention again is like it's important also to think in time we design a structure how it can be compacted within a small volume in order to be launched. And uh, so when you design, it can be a rigid structure, you know, in a flexible structure with a lot tons of layers. Like actually, it can be uh, uh, can be uh, a sort of your know, pressurized bubble to live inside it. You know, so be important and fundamental to understand how you're gonna fold it and pack it within uh, your launching system. Um, then, as I mentioned before, I'm, I'm also visiting Professor Predegno di Milano, where I teach the course Architecture for Human Space Exploration. It's a course that is collaborative with the MIT. And last year was with MIT Media Lab, uh, within Design Exploration Towards Human Architecture, together uh, with Professor Paradis uh, in uh, the space architect Guillermo Trotti, who actually actively designed portions of the International Space Station. So it was a true honor with, with him. Uh, and uh, so we collected within, since the, the, we wanted to tackle this multidisciplinarity, as we, I mentioned briefly before, we, we tried to invite several speakers that have different expertise, different knowledge, in order to understand really how we can better design using different types of materials, for example, using this organic material to actually self-grow a structure, uh, just adding, for example, water in it. And so this is a concept, for example, of mycelium, how we just need nutrients or algae, for example, they can actually grow over time. How we can use robotic fabrication. So we had Paul's from the University of Denmark talking about this and ESA, understanding what, what type of material can be 3D printed. We can also think of 3D printing also from foods up to organs at the moment. So it's really intriguing. Um, and some other space architects actually designing also in different type of concepts. And right now I show you the concept of living above ground, also to enable um, a faster exploration of the lunar surface with the two rovers and agile mobile habitats. But it also will be safer to build uh, also underground, okay? So within lava tubes are present in there, also trying to excavate and find your own underground area where you can actually really deploy your habitat. This is the safer because it actually creates a natural protection against uh, extreme environments. And uh, as output of all these uh, uh, activities, also we did with some astronauts like Professor Jeffrey Hoffman, who actually taught about Marxism, so experiment to um, retrieve oxygen uh, on Mars, and, and Paolo Nespoli, who spent uh, more than a year in the International Space Station in microgravity. We have some outputs on some of the students, and this, for example, is another surface habitat. They actually combine. Uh, the modules can actually be a rigid module with an inflatable structure, so it can be folded and then can be deployed uh, once pressurized. It can actually be integrated with a sort of a, a lunar regular shielding in here. You can see they can actually be 3D printed and cover the entire structure once it's deployed. Uh, and those are some concepts about interior design that are actually very minimal and allows actually to contain different areas and in, inside and different spaces. But we also have concepts, this is for example is for Mars, but it can actually be applicable uh, to the moon as well, concept of how we can design underground. So we find here a modular system and uh, in the Concept is called a modular element at the interior of our tube, and which type of infrastructure should actually be shared and actually uh, can actually intersect all different modules. And this, for example, the greenhouse was identified as the main key element being a full production system and need to be, and also generating also oxygen it can actually be very important uh, for the entire infrastructure. And so, this is another concept. But if you want to more, no more, I would suggest you to go on this website, Frame VR AHCE, where you can find this VR gallery when we collect the, the poster session of uh, the students' uh, projects. And we have a Mars gallery, and also you can see afterwards also the Moon gallery in here. So if you want to try curious, if you want to know more, we just I suggest to go and have a tour of all, all these posters. It's actually intriguing because they are all different solutions. And even if, if, you, if you notice there are some uh, aspects uh, and that actually makes um, um, a habitat on other planetary bodies sustainable, they all find out a way to make it uh, very, quite different. This is uh, uh, extremely intriguing. Uh, so thank you all uh, for the attention, and I think especially uh, this is a very exciting time to design for uh, enabling human space exploration, just 
this week we had these beautiful images by a web telescope and how we, the rise of new galaxies over there. So I think it's really an exciting time to um, foster your creativity and design the future of humanity. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such an enlightening talk, ma'am. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Sumini, on this uh, very exciting presentation which you shared. So I guess we have two questions. So I would like to read upon that. So what is an ideal form of, for an inflatable habitat? Oh, yes. So as I mentioned before, uh, the concept was having an inflatable structure and, uh, and, and you made the geometry that holds uh, somehow uh, the pressure at the third. You know, spherical bubbles are actually the perfect, uh, the perfect geometry that contain. But you can expand on that, and this actually was one of the subjects uh, um, of, of a recent workshop that we just uh, completed with the Magic Architecture Platform, where we tried to say, okay, uh, the bubble, but can we expand on that? So can we actually generate multiple forms that can actually be optimized to contain internal pressurization and just also have maybe different solution, for instance. And so it's intriguing because the computational design right now give us the opportunity to explore um, different geometries and, and adapt to the needs of really creating habitable volume that is interesting also from an interiors and architectural perspective. And it's also safe in terms of personalization and holding. Uh, of course, uh, there's the problem of uh, structurally optimization. You don't want to have anti-plastic curvature within your structure and you want actually to avoid it. So really simulating uh, what you would like to be, thinking of having uh, uh, one atmosphere inside and zero outside and put your reduced gravity condition. The reduced gravity you will notice will not really be uh, the main uh, load that would actually drive your design. The main load that would drive the design is, as I mentioned before, the pressurization load. So uh, try to simulate and understand how you can actually achieve this optimal. It's always uh, interesting. And you can use different tools to do that. And, uh, and um, it's a good way to start understanding uh, the type of uh, uh, syllabus of geometries you can actually use according to different functions that you might have inside each module. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Somini. So we have one more question. Can self-replating mycelium be used for radiation shielding and is it stable? Yeah, so the mycelium can be used for radiation shielding and I would like to uh, suggest you to look at the work by Red House Studio, uh, especially by Chris Maurer. Um, that invite actually every year uh, to give a talk in my course since uh, it's very intriguing. He's currently working on, on NASA on this type of thing. And actually, uh, when you put nutrients within the mycelium, yeah, mycelium grows. And then over time, when, when, it, when it, and it becomes stable, it becomes actually a very rigid panel. And it's very good also for thermal insulation. So it can also have lots of application here on Earth, for instance. But it's also extremely good also for radiation protection. Uh, and uh, so one, one possibility would be generating this uh, uh, um, uh, sort of membrane where you could actually, they can actually, you already know uh, the target geometry that you might want to have at the very end. And then you can fill it with MSC, you can put nutrients in it and then it will just grow over time when it just ended up become, become stable. And then this would be your uh, shielding structure for your habitat. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sumini. So I guess uh, that's all we are having. I mean, we, know we are having no more questions. So we would like to thank you for taking your time and presenting such an interesting uh, topic on the lunar architecture. So it was very informative. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumini. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. It's been a great yeah. pleasure. Bye. Yes. So I would like